uh, and uh, we'll see if there are any questions on problem set 12 for starters. People um, are, at least one person's nodding, or are you headbanging? I can't tell. No, I'm nodding. That's a big so, nod. Hey, good. Okay. Number one was uh, was my trouble question. Okay. Definitely. So uh, number one was use the definition of the Laplace transform. Is that the one? Yep. Use the formal definition to find the Laplace transform. Got it. Got it. Okay. Which which part? A or B? Actually, it was a little bit of both. It was just when I got to the like taking the integral. And then, well, I was able to take the integral of a, but then like doing the limit, it, I wasn't sure where to go because I had to take like the limit of like the cosine of 3b and the limit of e to the 2 minus s times b. And I just wasn't sure what to do with that. Okay. Well, one thing to keep in mind is <clears throat> when you're doing the uh, limit of a cosine or a sine, just a standard limit of a cosine or a sine, as the internal guts approach infinity, that's just going to wobble back and forth between you know negative negative one and positive one, right? So that technically doesn't have a limit; it doesn't converge on a particular value. But when you integrate this puppy, uh, because you wind up having to use integration by parts, you wind up with kind of multiple multiple parts. So one of the parts does converge, but another part doesn't. Does that make sense? So yeah. do you, does anybody have what they what they did for it and would be willing to share so we can take a look at it and talk through even if you're you're not com comfortable with it being right it doesn't matter we'll be able to talk through it I can share mine if you guys want Sure yeah fire away So for 1a, yep, we could plug it into the formula. The formula says integral from 0 to infinity of the function f of t times e to the negative st. You combine those exponentials, same base, so you scooch their uh, exponents together. And then you turn it into a limit problem. And it becomes taking the limit of a definite integral. And that definite integral you can totally do in Maple. Right, just like Paul did here. I don't. I didn't expect you to do integration by parts by hand, but you certainly could if you wanted to. If you want to just prove how big and tough you are, that's fine. Um, notice Paul winds up with this thing, and notice there there would be multiple terms, and the terms that have the uh, cosines and the sines and all that stuff, those don't go anywhere as B approaches infinity because they just wobble back and forth between negative one and positive one. So it doesn't matter what you plug in for S, those are never going to converge as B goes to infinity. So we turn our attention to the parts that don't have a cosine or a sine involved with them, which is way at the end, um, the S minus two, and only that part, the S minus two on top and the remaining <clears throat> excuse me, uh, denominator on the bottom. Only those really matter uh, for this particular problem. As B approaches infinity, that's what we're left with, with the part of it that converges. Everything else doesn't converge, but that part does. does. And so we're left with that for particular values of S, right? And the only catch is that in this case, S has to be greater than... Um, was it greater than negative two or no? Greater than two. Greater than two. Yeah. So that was the part I had trouble with. Mm -hmm. I wasn't sure where the domain of S should be. Yeah. So the um, the only way it can converge is if the um, oh I'm I'm using my scroll wheel like I wanted to scroll up and I'm like wait a minute why isn't that going up because it's not my screen duh the the thing that we have to be concerned with is the uh, part of the um, the part of the function that is the exponential. And so the e to the 2t part, that's going to have the um, limiting, um, limited domain when we take the Laplace transform. So if you, if you take a look at the table that's in the, the notes, you'll notice that the sine and the cosine, uh, those don't get their undies in a twist over whether S is positive or negative or whatever. But when you have the exponential on there, that, that matters a great deal. And so um, S has to be greater than or um, equal to two. Or no, greater, greater than two, just greater than two. Okay. 
I thought it was different because on the table, there's a separate thing for the exponential times the cosine. It doesn't have a domain for that Wait, one. Wait, does it? It doesn't have a domain on that? No. Oh. That's my recollection is incorrect then. <laughs> yeah. So if we were looking, can you scroll up? Oh, actually, no, right there is fine uh, where you've got it. The <clears throat> S minus two on top, and the um, rewritten form when we do a complete the square on the bottom. The only problem that you could run into is where that thing doesn't exist or where it blows up and you know becomes infinitely large. That's not gonna be a problem with, you know, as B goes to infinity in the limit, that doesn't affect this portion of the result. And so for this one, the only thing you really care about is where if you could have zero on the top, or excuse me, zero on the bottom, and you'll notice that that's not possible because using the completing the square, this thing has no domain restrictions because of that, so. So for part B, this, it looks horrible. It looks like it's gonna be way more complicated, but really for part B, it's just a matter of splitting it up between two, um, so what I'm looking for, two integrations or two integrals. So if you, let me share mine real quick. I'll, I'll just scribble a little bit on this pad. If you were to do, um, oh, let me make it so I can see the problem there. If we were gonna do the integral from zero to infinity of the function sine t when t is greater than zero, but less than pi, and otherwise it's equal to zero if t is greater than pi. Um, there's my f of t times e to the minus st dt. This thing we can think of as being really two integrals. This is the same thing as the integral from zero to pi of this part of it. Oh, sorry, this part of it right here, which is sine t times e to the minus st dt plus the integral from pi to infinity of zero e to the negative st dt. Does that make sense why, why I can say that? Because the original f of t is telling me that it behaves like the sine function, but only from zero to pi. So it doesn't make sense to talk about from zero to infinity because it, it stops behaving like sine of t. So I can only take it in this region right here, which by the way, you'll notice is really just a, um, uh, that's what I'm looking for. Uh, definite integral that I don't have to worry about. There's no limit necessary here, right? This is really boring. This one, we might have to worry about a limit, except the thing that's inside is zero. So this is really saying plus the limit as B approaches infinity of zero. evaluated from pi to, whoops, pi to b. Really boring. <laughs> so does this thing converge as b approaches infinity? Yeah, that's just plain old nothing. What about this one? That one doesn't converge. Or, well, what's the what's the integral of sine t times e to the minus st? What does that turn out to be? Again, you could do that by hand. You can use integration by parts to do it by hand. But I assume some of you did that in Maple, right? Or if you didn't do it already, you could do it right now. It's a <clears throat> negative e to the negative st cosine t over s squared plus one minus s times e to the negative st times sine of t 
over s squared plus one. And that thing is going to be evaluated from zero to pi. This whole thing right here is evaluated from zero to pi. Sorry, I ran out of space there. So what happens when I plug in zero? Well, the sign goes away. That term goes away for the second one. That just becomes zero on top. And remember, S is just along for the ride. It can be whatever. And when we plug in pi, cosine becomes negative 1, and sine becomes 0. So this thing becomes negative e to the negative st times cosine of, uh, cosine of pi is negative 1 over s squared plus 1 minus this whole thing just becomes zero when we plug in pi, minus this thing is uh, equal to one when we plug in, or excuse me, negative one, uh, zero when we plug in, uh, God, I can't talk today. When we plug in zero for t, cosine t becomes one, and so we're left with negative e to the negative st over s squared plus 1, and then this guy right here at 0, that whole thing is 0 as well. So those two terms don't matter. And these two look remarkably similar, but this becomes positive, and so does this become positive. And we're left with 2e to the negative st over s squared plus 1. Yeah, I thought this one was going to be a heavy side function. That's what I did. How so? Like from well, the beginning? Yeah, right from the beginning, it looked like a heavy side deal where it's like sine t from zero to pi, and then it becomes zero after that. It looked like a switch. And switch. So you could make the argument that it goes like from zero to pi or to infinity of this thing could be written as. Uh, we want it to behave like sine of t, but only between 0 and pi. So that means, what would it have to be here? 1 minus u sub pi t? Does that mean it's on? No, no. Ugh, ugh. It's going to be more complicated. Ugh. What did you, how did you translate that into a heavy side function? Well, I thought it would be sine t times like u sub zero t minus u sub pi t. Oh, okay. I graphed it and it looked and it worked out. Okay, yeah. So the way you had it written would have been starting with it like, like this, saying integral from zero to infinity of sine t times what would it be u sub zero t minus u sub pi t, like that? Yeah, that's how I did it, yeah. Yeah, I agree. Times, I had times e to the negative st. Well, yeah, of course, yeah, because we need the e to the negative st, yeah. so e to the negative st there. The only trouble with that is integrating this. I mean, you could type it into maple, right, and integrate right. that. But remember, integrating from zero to infinity is still going to require us to split it up. And recognizing that we have something happening, um, you know, before u or before uh, t equals zero doesn't really matter because that's where we're starting our integral. But it changes, it fundamentally changes character here. So when we multiply this through, we're going to have two terms. And they're basically going to play out like I had up above. Similar. Sorry, I have an eye infection that's like bugging me today. And my hair's getting too long. So the good news is 
I'm not going to ask you to do this stuff by hand on the exam, right? I just want you to be comfortable fusing some calc two with the concept of heavy side function and making sense of Laplace in the context of the calculus that you've already seen. So yeah, it's just playing around with things. Other questions on the, the problem set? Is there going to be a problem sort of similar to 10B? Like, are we going to see that again in the near future? 10, 10 B, you said? Yeah. Um, uh, uh, that was the only well, other one that really got me. But I just didn't. Well, on the, let's put it this way. On the final exam, I'm not going to... Um, there will be a problem similar to 10 in the sense that there will be a, an undamped harmonic oscillator that has a periodic forcing function. Mm -hmm. But I'm not, but I'm not going to say you have to use the Laplace transform method to solve it. Gotcha. Okay. Yeah. 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 So it, it really was an exercise in, hey, we already know how to do this at least one other way, but let's verify we should get the same result if we use the Laplace transform method. That's all I was doing with that one. How about number seven? I'd like to hear somebody describe their process for doing number seven. Kind of walk us through what you did and what you came up with. Okay. Fire away. Um, okay, so I was looking at the graphs from five a little bit and to make that, it just made me think of a uh, absolute value function when I was just looking at the shape. Mm -hmm. So I basically split it up into like two separate areas. And so from zero to two, it's doing just the regular absolute value of T function. Okay. And then that stops with this heavy side. And then I add in basically another one that does the second half and that's negative absolute value plus four to uh, line it up properly. Cool. Does it work? Does it look so. does it look right, everybody? Is that is that the same thing that everybody else did? I did that except for without the absolute values. Yeah, so my question my question to you, Crithany, is do we need the absolute values? Yeah, actually no, I just realized I don't even need them. <laughs> yeah, because you're saying between zero and t equals two, you know that t is positive, so you don't even need the absolute values there. So go ahead and remove the absolute value in there and then remove yeah, exactly, up front and in there, and run it and let's see if we should should give us the exact same graph. Oh no, negative t on that one. Wait, what did I do? I don't know. That's a good question. Did... Oh, probably needs to be a... Yeah. Good call, whoever did that. Nice work. So is there any other way we might have produced that exact same graph using a heavy side function? I think you're onto something with the absolute value. Could you do this without using three parts? Because you have one where it turns on at t equals zero and then turns off at t equals two and something else turns on at t equals two and then it turns off at t equals four. Is there a way we could do this by turning on at zero and off at four? Yeah, I, I think if the, you did, oh, go ahead. I used the shifted absolute value function. Okay, show us what you did. I wanna see what you did. I, I got this function right here. Nice. It's inverted and shifted right to and up to. Yeah. So it's, 
beautiful. It's just like the absolute value function, but it's shifted right to, it's inverted and shifted right to and up to. Nice work. Yeah, and so all we have to do is say, okay, turn on at t equals zero, turn off at t equals four. So it turns out there's actually multiple ways to get these functions. So if I give you a graph, I'm not expecting you to do it one way. I'm expecting you to, to prove that you can do it a way and get a graph that is a reproduction of, of what's going on there. So really good exam question because that way I can kind of get to follow your logic and your reasoning. I, I honestly, if it were me, I would have been like, okay, there's one line segment, then there's another line segment, <laughs> turn on, turn off, turn the next one turns on, and then turn off. I would, have, I would have done it in three line segments or three heavy side functions, right? But then, you know, you look at it later and you're like, oh yeah, I guess you could only do use one function and just turn on in one place and turn off in another place. But the tricky part is figuring out how to kind of turn on in one place and turn off in, the other, in another place. And once you see a couple of them and you practice with that, it's not too bad. It just, you're writing it in line as a heavy side functions. It just takes a little bit of practice. So really good exam question. So what else? What else tripped you up or what else did you find engaging? Nothing else? No other questions? Everything else made sense? Well, I'll take that as a good sign until I start grading, <laughs> uh, which I will start doing probably tomorrow. Uh, I'm going to try to get things graded and back to you um, for the, the last problem set um, by Friday. I've got a lot of meetings lined up tomorrow, so I'm, I may have to grade around that, but I'll try to do that. Um, I think I mentioned this once before, but on the final exam, I'm going to ask you to um, only for, I think, one problem do I ask you to actually do anything by hand. Uh, and that's a problem of, here's a differential equation, or here's an initial value problem. Solve it using the Laplace transform method. Solve it using Maple with dsolve. Solve it using um, Euler's method. Solve it using uh, the integrating factor method. Solve it using the lucky guess method. Solve it, I mean, as many different ways as we know how to solve it. So that's the only time I'm gonna ask you to do things by hand. But the good news is, you know, because you'll solve it using Maple, using dsolve, you'll know what the answer is. So it's just a matter of making sure that you can reproduce the steps for each one of those methods, right? So in the old days, it used to be very high stakes. I'd have like one Laplace transform method and you didn't get to have Maple and you had to do it all by hand. And oh, right. eh. yeah, I want you to be able to, uh, reproduce the method, but you're, you'll know what the answer is going into it. Okay, so if there's no more uh, homework questions, let's turn our attention to the uh, exam review. Uh, I want to take a look, especially at that first page. Is there anything else? Because this is like, this is my brainstorm list of all the things that I could think of. Is there anything else that's not on that list that was an important part of you know what we did something that you think oh what about this it's not on the list take a second look it over if you haven't already and we'll try to figure out are we missing anything
Okay, so is there anything that's not on that list? Not because I'm looking for more things to add to the exam. I'm just curious whether you think there was something that's not represented there that you think should be. Ooh, how about this one? So anything on the list that scares you? That you're like, oh crap, I hope we don't have a question on that. All of it. Come on, <laughs> come on. No, but seriously, is there anything, there's like something in there that you're like, oh yeah, I probably should review that. Just looking at the list, does that help? Kind of organize your thinking like, oh, these are the things that I probably should make sure my notes are really clear on. Yeah, Euler's method for me, I got to go back and look at an example yeah, of that. that that's a killer. Euler's method's a killer. If for only because the code, we didn't use it all that much in Maple. We, we used it a couple of times to do some specific tasks, and then we moved on. And the numerical methods, you know, we, we haven't spent tons of time on, but you should be able to refer back and figure out what the code is to be able to enter that stuff. So having an example handy that you can use as, as a, a guide, that'd be really useful. And remember, it's not just about the raw, these little things, these four things are what you need in the code. It's also about the, remember how we had to tweak it a little bit with like num steps and, and things like that. We had to kind of mess around with it. We, we did some different things to produce a different output, you know. Um, output equals table, or what was it? Output equals array for um, Euler's method for an, a system. So just if the, if those are kind of in the back of your head, like, oh yeah, I can't remember that. That would be a really good thing to spend a little bit of time making sure you've got an example that you're ready to go, just so that you don't spend an hour trying to solve a you know Euler's method problem on the final exam that really shouldn't take you that long. What else? Anything else that you observe about the list? Bunch of chatty Cathy's tonight. And that's how Santa Claus got his name. So, oh, hey, how's it going? Huh? Good to see you. <laughs> we were just talking about um, the list at the beginning of the exam review, the final exam review document, and kind of identifying particular spots where maybe I want to focus on that and I want to review that a little bit more than some of the other ones. And um, uh, Chris said, Euler's method, probably one of those things that you want to go back and make sure you've got a good example that you can rely on for come exam time. So. Any other questions in terms of um, like the layout that I kind of have down at the bottom, short answer questions and solve type questions, Maple and course notes available. Anything about the logistics of the exam that you're curious about, wondering about? That's my dog. She has a question. I, I'll ask. I, I know. Hold on. Okay, I'm getting to it. She said, I can't answer if you keep... Anyways, yeah, she was wondering if you all have notes prepared and whether you've got your old problem sets kind of lined up and ready to go is on the, on the standby. Have you gone back and taken a look at your old um, assignments? No? I, I tried to give decent enough feedback so that you'd be able to make corrections. So I don't know if you did that, you went back and made corrections on some of your homework, that would be a useful thing to do. Go back and take a look at the things that you might have missed points on. What could you do to correct them? Because, you know, there's only uh, this range of type of questions that I could ask on the final, and some of them are probably going to end up looking like uh, old problem set questions, right? At least in some way, shape, or form. Cool. 
Well, uh, since this activity was a bust. Well, actually, you know what? No, it could be one of two things. It could be that I have done such a good job of preparing you and you have done such a good job of studying and preparing for this moment that you're sitting there like, let me at him. I have no questions. I am ready to go. I want to charge in there. Just rah. Or I can't think of any other possible explanation for your silence. I just can't. That's got to be it. It's the only possible explanation. This is what I like to refer to as the teacher bias, which is the, they must know what they're doing because they don't have any questions, right? Because if you don't have any questions, then that means I did my job so well that you're just in awe of the content and you completely understand it. Or it could be that you're so overwhelmed you don't even know where to begin to ask questions. But no, 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 that couldn't possibly be the case. That's crazy. Anyways, okay, so here's what we're going to do. We are going to turn our attention to the exam review questions that follow that document. And you'll notice they are uh, numbered on the document. And you have in your groups, in your teams, you have specific problems. I was very creative about how I went about assigning them. I said, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. That's how I did it. So apologies if you got two clunkers, but you know, that's just the nature of the beast. So your group is responsible for coming up with those four problem solutions. Um, I will be around. I'm going to pop in and check on rooms, but mostly I'm going to try to let you guys work. If you have a question, you can let me know. And I'm going to say we're going to get back together no later than about 7.10. So headed in that direction. So. Sound good? Okay. Well, I'm going to open up the rooms now. And Emma, I'm going to have to assign you to the room here in a second. I'll assign you to room number three. There you go. Go play. Have fun. So let's go ahead and take a look at the exam review, starting with number one. Who had number one? That was me and Matt. Excellent. So we used, one second, I, I got to write something down. Okay. So first of all, what chapter is this one from? We used 1.9. That was what I was writing down, actually. Um, there it is. What we did is we used the integrating factor technique, which was, again, 1.9. We said our G B over T, and we did some fancy stuff. I can't, I did it all by hand. That was the instructions. I'm gonna see if I can like okay. try the stock cam technique again. Sure. Or you could just show it to us, I guess. I don't know how to work. Like hold it up to the camera. That sounds a little bit difficult. Yeah, it might be. Airplane. John's been showing us what he's been drinking all semester, so. Thanks, John. All right. I got this thing right here. Okay. All right, so what we did was we got our g of t function, which we said was negative three over t because that was this, but subtracted over, right? And then mu naught from the notes is just e to the integral of g of t. So we did that and it came out as natural log. So we got one over t, that's supposed to be cubed. And so we plugged it in here, we multiplied over everything. Okay, so real quick, how did you know to make it negative three over t? Why did you divide out by t? Why did I divide out by t? Because <laughs> the original problem, we wanted this alone. And so we just divided everything by t. So we got negative three over t. Yep, the integrating just, factor method only works if it's just dy dt. There's nothing in front of the derivative. So yeah. nailed it. Good job. So then we came over here and we multiplied it by everything. So then we got this, which then we uh, said, hey, you know, that just simplifies down to the derivative of that times that. 
So that's what we did, and then equals this. So then we integrated both sides, and then uh, we just added a constant and stuff. That's about it. Yep, multiplied by t cubed. Away you go. Cool. And of course, you can verify that in Maple, right? So we did, yes. Nice. It checks out. How about number two? That would be us. I can share here. Okay. So it said solve is different to solve. Find the general solution analytically. So we tried using, and this is from 3.4, by the way. Yep, very good. And I was trying to follow the bonus notes on that, which is a very long and complex problem. So we we found the eigenvectors of the complex eigenvectors, or I mean eigenvalues, not eigenvalues. And so finding the eigenvectors, we did all this. I don't know how much this you want me to explain. It's very not long. a lot. Not a lot. And so what, was the, what were the notes that you used for this? I'm still trying to write them all down. Point four. Three point four. Mm -hmm. Thank you. So then we found the eigenvector, which was this, and we can kind of confirm it with Maple. Yep. Well, both eigenvectors actually. So then we tried putting them all together, and kind of strung it all together, and then we used Euler's formula to convert the i t to cosine. Or wait a minute, what did we do? Oh, to convert the e to the square root of two i t to cosine and sine. And we had it that there, and then we were. We got to this point, and then that's about when we ran out of time. You're in the process. So one thing to just remember, remember the, the kind of the dirty little secret of section 3.4 is you don't actually need both eigenvalues and both eigenvectors. You only need one. So you could have stopped right after you said eigenvectors and Maple gave it to you and, and taken the first eigenvalue and its associated eigenvector and then set that up, pulled it apart, and used... Uh, Euler's method or Euler's formula on that and it would have turned into two terms and that would have worked out just as well as, as what you did what you were doing there. So you just added a little bit more work for yourself. What is she going on about? You must have people walking dogs outside or something. I don't know. So excellent use of the method. It's very long and tedious and we don't like to do it but you should know how to do it and be familiar with the process. So, okay, uh, and so you find the general solution, and once you have the general solution, you can find the particular solution, and then you could create, uh, what could you do to answer part C, which is describe the solution's behavior on the phase plane. You can do a, a DE plot, or just look at the, um, the function that you got. And uh, for ours, I looked and I did a, a D solve just to find the actual solution. And it looks like it's just exponential decay on both uh, the X of T and Y of T. So it'll just so head towards, kind of, yeah. Zero, so we zero. expect it to be spiraling inward towards the origin. Yeah. Yeah, that makes sense. That makes sense. Okay, how about number three? Okay, I have it. I will share my screen. Mm -hmm. Awesome. Okay. So for three, this is 3.6 bonus notes. Okay. For the most part. So this is a little there, bit of chapter four thrown in there as well. Yep. Yeah. So um, the other right here is the our equation that we're kind of given. It's mass times second derivative. Um, damping says the first derivative. Um, three constant times y of t and then our forcing function. So um, our A given here, our amplitude is the is the constant out in front of this of the forcing function, and then we said that because we have a, we have omega in here and period is two pi over omega to get our to get our function in terms of the period of, of p for the period we solved for omega here to get p, and then we then we uh, inputted this. Or where omega was. This is our like, kind of the equation we got for not 100% confident, but no, no, it looks good. Okay, and then for and then for describing what our constant or our constants mean, a is our amplitude, so it's the height 
in a in the graph, it's the height of our forcing of the of the sine of our forcing function. And p is the time required for the complete one fold. So it's going to come up and that's it's that horizontal spacing. And then um, for our initial conditions, we did y of zero to zero and y prime of zero, basically saying that we're going to start with no motion at a unstretched unstressed position on that that uh, spring. Now, if it was unforced, if there was no forcing function, and you start at rest at the equilibrium position, what would you predict would happen? We just wouldn't go anywhere, right? And just sit there, right? So you have to have a forcing function in order for at rest and equilibrium position to be anything interesting, right, as, a, as initial conditions. So nice work. Good job. How about number four? I'm trying to move us along here. If you, by the way, if you have a question, feel free. You can you can uh, shout out a question, but we're going to try to keep moving here. Well, I got most of number four done, thanks to Maple. When I was trying to plow through it analytically, that was taking forever. So right off the bat, I took the eigenvalue just to make sure what I got down here was correct. I actually did this first and did that second, and turns out it's right. Eigenvectors is going to be so much longer, so I just, you said I could punch that in maple, so I did, because that was becoming a chore. Yeah. And I wrote the straight line solutions, wrote them in the general solution. I think I did that right. Yep, the only thing that you'd be missing if you're going to write it that way would be your K1 times E to the blah, blah, times the, the value on the top plus, oh, no, no, yep. Oh, no, wait a minute plus k2 times e and so that one would also be oh, also times yeah uh, no no you were right that one would be minus because that's your oh, second straight line solution okay. and then that thing would be multiplied by the top of eigen vector number two so negative five over two minus gotcha. i root 11. oh and these down here would all just be one Exactly. Yep. You got it. Uh, ah, what happened? I copy paste error. Yep. Yep. There you go. And I did not get to the solution. Wait. That's okay. So the next step would be um, you could now you, you could. Realistically, you could just jump right in and say, I have the general solution. You could just as easily desolve that system, right? Okay. Or you could go ahead and say, I have my initial conditions set up two equations when t equals when t equals zero. You know, x is gonna equal four, y is gonna equal zero. Mm -hmm. Yep. So right. cool. You're heading in the right direction. Any questions on that one? Number five. All right. So we had to solve this analytically right here, this equation. So at first I just desolved it to see what it would be. And this is what I ended up getting. Yep, doesn't look too bad. Okay. So then the method that ended up working for me was the Laplace thing. And that's just all the mumbo jumbo right there. And I got, ended up getting the same thing. Yep. I like that mumbo jumbo. <laughs> and then I decided to do a D plot of it using what I was trying to do with the matrix with uh, splitting it up into a system. Mm -hmm. So then I ended up getting a D plot that looks like this. And then it's a saddle point because of the eigenvalues that I had, which was one negative and one positive. So, and you can see that on the on the graph. Yeah, nice. And then I just compared um, the D plot seen with the regular plot of the D solve, which ended up being the same. And they look exactly the same. Cool, nice, very thorough. You see, you see it a couple of different ways and verified it, kind of cross-referenced it. That's nice. Good job. 
how about number six? That was me, uh, me and Steven. So this was the original equation that we were given. Um, we needed to find the equilibrium points, which I found were negative five and two. And so then after that, um, so those are our points right there. And afterwards I tested numbers um, down here in between the two and then greater than two. And uh, I found out that this was negative, the middle was positive and this one was negative. Um, which made that top one a sink and that bottom one a source. Cool. The only thing that I would suggest would be um, they're not both Y1. One of them's Y1, the other one's Y2. Doesn't matter which is which, but that's cool. Lovely. Do you remember how to do phase lines? It's been a while. Chapter one was a while ago. Does it look familiar? There's going to be a question like that on the exam. Okay, how about number seven? That was me. And that was really pretty simple. All we had to do was desolve it, which got us the general solution, and then we desolve it with initial condition, and that got us the particular solution. That was easy, easy peasy. Yep, so knowing the code is the key here. If you didn't know the code, if you had to do that by hand, what would you do? What method would you choose? Probably, I'm not sure. I have to go back and look. So it's a, yeah, it's a, um, it's a section 4.1 problem, really. So if you're looking at number seven, that's really a section 4.1 problem. So remember that's find the homogeneous part of the solution, find the particular solution, add them together. So how about number eight? This is a word problem, a little essay problem. Who had number eight? Okay, so I didn't have, we didn't have a whole lot written down because it, it was the last one we went back. I believe it was chapter three, maybe two. Yeah, this one would definitely be a chapter three. Chapter three, yep. Okay, so um, the I, the uh, given characteristic polynomials for the system of linear difference equation, we, if you remember correctly, that was the eigenvectors and, eigenval and eigenvalues, if I'm correct, if I remember correctly. Um, so that basically tells us the um, where our d our uh, face plane or de plot our face plane the arrows are are pointing and if I'm remembering correctly. So so walk me through. So the, give me an example of a characteristic polynomial. <laughs> That's a good question. Okay. I, you're looking at page thirty three of the notes. Okay. Where, um, we have labeled char uh, characteristic polynomials, and then we solve like six, six minus lambda, three minus lambda minus or uh, plus two to zero, like characteristic polynomial, and then we solve for our eigenvalues and then our eigenvectors. Okay, so if all you have is the characteristic polynomial, you can definitely tell me what the eigenvalues are. Can you tell me what the eigenvectors are? No, no, you can't. Yeah, you can't tell the eigen, eigenvectors. Yeah, all, all I know is the eigenvalues. How about this? If I know both of the eigenvalues, what can you tell me about the origin of the phase plane? You can find where it is. Well, the origin of the phase plane is at zero, zero, right? We can yeah. definitely find where it is. But what can you tell me about the origin? if I know both of the eigenvalues. And by the way, what are the options for the, the two eigenvalues? Can you tell which one is more dominant? You can. You can tell which, which of the straight line solutions is more, more dominant mm -hmm. by looking at what? The larger magnitude of the eigenvalue. If they happen to both be real, you can do that. Mm -hmm. if what happens if they're complex with imaginary parts? What does that tell you about the phase plane? Spiral. 
Yeah. And it's, it could be a spiral or it could be, you know, just ellipsoids, right? So this is, there's a lot going on with this question. If you know the characteristic polynomial, then you know the eigenvalues. If you know the eigenvalues, then you know either it's two real eigenvalues or two complex eigenvalues or one repeated real eigenvalue. Those are really the only three options. And that translates, if you remember, to uh, overdamped, critically damped, and underdamped if you're talking about a harmonic oscillator. So that kind of connects in with the harmonic oscillator stuff. But if all we know is the characteristic polynomial, the only thing you can talk about are what the eigenvalues are and what that might mean for everything else. So I think, if I remember correctly, I think there was an exam question that was similar to that. I think it was a, sim a similar exam, similar to an exam question. So definitely, there's a lot going on with that question. It's not, it's not just a, you know, the eigenvalues. It's like, well, you know what's going on in the center of the phase plane. It could be a spiral sink, could be a spiral source. It could be a saddle point where they're kind of going in opposite directions. It could be a sink or it could be a source, you know, if everything's running away. So how about number nine? Number nine. Um, I had number nine, uh, which is a mixture problem. And uh, so I just made like, let's see if it'll show up. I made that handy dandy little tank, if you can see it. Nice, yeah. <laughs> My inputs and outputs. Um, and then I found the general solution with maple. Did the because it's separable, so I went through that and did. But I just did it with maple. <laughs> um, and then the actual question is how much salt when is in there when the tank is full. But I don't know if I'm just forgetting because like it it says that the the tank is a 30 gallon tank, but that's in gallons. But I have an equation with time. <laughs> So here's the question. If there's, if it's a 30 gallon tank, how much liquid is in there to begin with? 15 gallons. How many right. gallons, how many gallons per minute is it gaining? Two. Nope. Yeah. Two, two gallons per minute. And how did you get that? It's just in the, it's in the problem. Or am I supposed to get that from somewhere else? <laughs> no, no, I mean, you're on the right track. So you're, okay. so it's gaining two gallons per minute. Mm -hmm. How much is it losing? One gallon per minute. Oh, that's right. We have to do the subtraction. So it actually so, has a net of one gallon. I got it. So yeah. how many minutes is it going to take to fill up? 30. <laughs> well, if it were empty to begin with, yes. Oh, right. Oh, right. So it'd be 15 because we're only minutes. going 15. Okay. So back so to your original statement is... What is the amount of salt at 15 minutes? That's the answer to the question. Okay. So yep. It's kind of sneaky, but it's a multi -part. It is. So then I have my pull over here. So that means that there's 27.2 and some pounds of salt. There you go. After it's full. There you go. Cool. Awesome. So do you think that I'm going to ask you a mixing question? Do you think I'm going to ask you a mixing question that asks you to draw me a picture of a tank and prove what the units are for everything? Unit analysis? <laughs> you, think, you think I kind of harp on unit analysis a little bit? Yeah, just a smidge, right? Just a smidge. Don't worry, I'll be more thorough. And I'm no, no, it's, that's okay. <laughs> we're, we're just ripping through these. I just want to make sure that we've, got, we've talked about them a little bit. What How chapter about, is that? Um, yeah, good, qu good question. What, cha what chapter, what section was that? Uh, I'm using, I used the first example, which was in like, uh, I don't know, maybe like 1.3-ish. 1.2, yeah. 1.2. And then the one that's a little more helpful is in 1.6. Yep. Yeah. 1.9, I think. 1.9. <laughs> yeah. So it's, um, the 1.2 section is the one where inputs and outputs are equal in magnitude. So there's no net change in the amount of liquid in the tank. And then we made it a little bit more complicated in 1.9, where you can have different different amounts of input and output. 
And that, that's basically the difference between homogeneous differential equation and non-homogeneous differential equation. So that's why we had to wait until 1.9 to be able to solve that problem. It just, we wouldn't have been able to solve it otherwise. Cool. How about number 10? I got something for that. Another word problem. Yeah. So basically what I was thinking is uh, once you solve for your particular solution, you plug it back into the original equation to verify and see if it like equals um, both sides. So I just used the problem I had for number five um, and then the, its particular solution. And then I plugged it back in and differentiated it so I could plug it in for each of those. Nice. Yep. Zero. And you proved that it equals zero. So my only, my only, it's not a gripe, but my only comment on this would be the first word in the question is? Explain. <laughs> so what you, what you typed here is a perfect example of using a solution and, and proving that a solution really, you know, verifying a solution. But along with what you were just saying out loud, that would be the explanation. Mm -hmm. yep. So nice work. Good example. How about number 11? That would be Matt and I. I know, it's very exciting. So we had, well, number 11. Uh, the question was, uh, we have a harmonic oscillator. We want to explain the physical context of the oscillator. So we said that um, it is underdamped. And we believe it is underdamped because five squared is 25. But three times 2.5 times four is greater than 2.5. So that's, if you go to 3.6 bonus notes. Got it, yes. Where we talked about the damping coefficient and if it's squared and less than or greater than or equal to four times K and M and stuff and yeah. And so also there's a driving function kind of, but it's only turns on at T equals four. Does just, Four count as a driving function. Yeah, it's like it, a constant. It's like a constant force. It's like uh, that last example in in six point three, where all of a sudden the table kind of tips, and you've got a constant gravitational force. It counts. It's a driving force. It's just a constant force. So yeah, we have a constant force of four. So that's fun. Then also, as far as initial values go, we have an initial velocity of negative one meters per second. So that's it's a speed going to the left but uh, position two units to the right. So yeah. It starts off on the right-hand side, but heading to the left. But being, it was pushed to the left. So the, the only thing I will make sure that, I mean, you, you got everything, and I, and I know you know this, but when I say the physical context of the oscillator, what I'm saying is, what does the three mean? What does the five mean? What is the 2.5? And I know you know what they mean, because you gave me even more you told me it was, was it underdamped? Yes. Oh, you told me it's underdamped, so that means you know what each one of those stands for. But the physical context of the oscillator is, what is the, what are each one of those numbers represent in reality? What are they modeling? So you could have just said, a mass of three on a spring with a spring constant of 2.5 with a damping uh, coefficient of five, and you can go from there. So, cool. How about number 12, another word problem? That is me. Um, <laughs> so for this one, uh, it was just asking, when can we use the extended li linearity principle? And I think it's only in cases when we're dealing with specifically non-homogeneous or homogeneous differential equations of the form y double prime plus py prime plus qy equals g of t. Cool. So what does it mean to use the extended linearity principle? What does that, what does that let us do? It lets us combine a particular solution of the entire function and add it to a general solution of the related homogeneous function 
and you get the general solution of the entire function. Nicely put. Well done. Good job. Thanks. How about number 13? Oh, we got a pretty pictures. <laughs> so it says, uh, um, sketch the X and Y, X, Y, and Y of T. Sorry, X of T and Y of T um, parametric graphs. Sorry. So basically, it just for our Y of T and T graph, you can just follow the pattern that Y of T just goes straight down and it stays at zero. And we don't know any time values, so I didn't put any numbers down here. And for, for the X of T graph, we know it goes it goes closer to zero, then it shoots up exponentially. Oh. Well, we know it increases, whether it increases, increases exponentially. Yeah. Hmm. But definitely gets larger and larger and larger as T goes by. Okay, so, so my one comment on that one was, you're right, we don't have any specific values for T, but lining up the axes vertically so that the t-axis for your x-graph and the t-axis for your y-graph line up vertically. That would be uh, worthwhile to do. Because that way you can look and say, as we go to the, for you guys, as we go to the right, we can see at any given time what the x-coordinate and the y-coordinate would be just by looking horizontally at this. Gotcha. Cool. How about number 14? I have a quick question about that. Oh, yeah, go ahead. Sure. Um, would you rather have it like the way me and Bryce did it where it's um, two separate graphs, or would you rather have it like 14 right here where it's they're on the same? Honestly, I'm cool with either way. I think okay. for me, in terms of creating it for number 13, I think I would find it easier to create two separate graphs lined up yeah. vertically on the same T-axis or the same T-scale. Okay. I, I mean, but if you, if you can do it so that you can produce them on the same um, – axis set. The only thing you'd have to worry about then is labeling the graph so it's obvious which one is X and which one is Y. Okay. Yep. Number 14. That, that was ours, one of the ones we did not get to because yeah. we spent like all our time on. We spent all our time on four and nine, so yeah. Okay, so Looking at fourteen, what would you what would you suggest as a strategy for that one? And Emma, his computer's probably gonna crap out any second now, so uh oh, I can't see what it says. Were you drawing it or oh, no, I have the for some reason it wouldn't load on my actual computer oh, so I'm, I'm okay. looking at it on my phone <laughs> Got it. i'm like wow you you drew it on your phone that's impressive <laughs> so we've got the parameterized graphs and we're trying to reproduce what the phase plane would look like so what do you see going on with the x of t graph how would you describe its behavior over time it starts off at an x value of two positive two and then does what <laughs> I mean, it looks like it's oscillating, of course, but it looks like they're also getting like smaller, smaller oscillations. So it's right. oscillating, but the amplitude is decreasing. So if you imagine, here, let me share my screen with you here. If you were to imagine an X of T graph, I'm going to put X up here. This will be X, and then this will be y down here. So if you were to put x, x starts at a positive 2, let's say positive 2 is right there, and then um, it's, it starts to decrease, and then starts to increase, and then it decreases, and you wind up with something that looks like this. At the same time, y starts at a little bit higher, and it's decreasing, it drops down, actually becomes negative, and comes up to be positive here, and then drops down, becomes a little bit less negative, becomes a little bit more positive, like that, right? So this is our parameterized graph. But what this is saying is if you try to combine these two on the xy plane, 
you know your starting location would be two comma three. So there's two, there's three. So there's the starting point right there. What is the X coordinate doing right away as time begins to flow? Decreasing. The X coordinate is decreasing. So it's going to go this way. And the Y coordinate is? Also decreasing. <laughs> also, also decreasing. So X is going this way while Y is going this way. So we expect it to start moving in that direction, right? Something like that. And then the interesting thing is the X coordinate is it always remains positive. The Y coordinate dips down a little bit to negative, but that means the entire graph must be on this side of the Y axis because X is always positive, right? And so you might see something that looks like the X coordinate gets smaller and then grows and then smaller and then grows. So it's going to be going this way by getting smaller. And the Y coordinate is going to be going down, become negative a little bit, and then go up, not as high, but go down, become negative, and something like this. So you're probably going to wind up with something that looks like this. Where the X coordinate stays positive, but the Y coordinate occasionally dips down into the negative. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. So it's, it's kind of rethinking the graph kind of in the opposite direction as number 13. It's hard to do, but it's not, it's not something that you can, you know, shove into maple and have maple do for you. You have to kind of put it together and draw it, try drawing it and say, does that make sense based on what I've seen? Eh. A little bit of scratch paper goes a long way with something like this. So how about number 15? Yeah, how about number 15? We'll, we'll do, we'll try to do these in a speed round here. Number 15. Hey, that's me. Um, so my question was asking, explain how to examine a system of linear Ds written in matrix equation format so that you predict long-term solution of any of its particular solutions. And I said by examining linear Ds written in a matrix form, it's possible to predict a long-term solution of any of its particular solutions for identifying straight line solutions. So you know which way they're uh, going. And then the eigenvectors in order to determine like uh, which type of origin is associated with its direction field. So the eigenvalues tell you what the origin is, whether it's a sink, a source, a saddle, a right. spiral center, a spiral sink, a spiral source, mm -hmm. right? Those, those, we can get that information from the eigenvalues, which you can find by turning this thing into a system of, um, you know, a matrix. Right. Cool. Nice. Okay, how about... Um, um, number 16 is kind of boring. I'm going to skip number 16, 17. How about 17 real quick? Sorry, I hate to skip number 16. I know you guys were really eager to do that one, but. Oh, that is me again. Number 17. So, yep, I will share. So for this one, it just wanted you to prove whether or not that the given eigenvector was uh, one for the matrix. So I found the actual eigenvectors, but to do it analytically, I set it up and I said the matrix times the uh, eigenvector has to be equal to the uh, to an eigenvalue times that eigenvector. And there was no, uh, neither of these uh, eigenvalues could make that true, so. Yep, there is no value of lambda that makes that a true statement. So it can't be an eigenvector. Nice, good job. You did it kind of both ways. You did it the quick and easy. What does Maple say the eigenvectors are? Oh, that was easy, you know. But there's also the proof that it isn't, and that's how you would do it. Um, number 18, snooze. That's boring. How about 19? Suppose we have four systems of linear differential equations, and we find the characteristic polynomial for their coefficient matrices. What can we say about the phase plane? This is kind of a throwback to a previous question where if we know the characteristic polynomial, what are we, what are we able to say about the phase plane in this case? So we had number 19. That was us again, and again, we did. 
He muted himself. We didn't Say get again. to that one. You didn't get to that one. Okay, so in the first case for 19A, what kind of eigenvalues are you going to have? Um, complex? There's, a, there's a fancy chart for this somewhere. Yeah, there is. But just looking at that, you can see solving that, um, if you turn that into a set it equal to zero and solve that quadratic equation, you're going to have plus or minus i, just imaginary. No real part, just imaginary. And plus or minus i means we've got just imaginary eigenvalues. What does that mean about our phase plane? I don't remember that. Anybody want to step in? Matt, I know you're itching. Okay. Matt, I know you're comatose. I mean, we have like a spiral. Or we end up with a spiral. Um, yeah, so if it's just imaginary, the real component of the uh, eigenvalue is equal to zero. That means it's not spiraling outward and it's not spiraling inward. It's just Awesome. It's just basically ellipse, uh, ellipses, or maybe if it's a perfect circle, it's just just a perfect circle. Decent music as well. So, hey, pop culture reference there. So, if you have just imaginary eigenvalues, then your phase plane is going to have a center that is a spiral center. Or excuse me, a, um, that's what I'm looking for. God, my brain is not working, not spiraling, but uh, good God, why am I not thinking of this? Circulating. Circulating. <laughs> it's going around, it's going around. It's elliptical, it's, it's you know, it's Harmonic. a center. <laughs> eh, no, it's something simple. I'm just, my brain's not working right now. So in each one of those cases, you should be able to look at the characteristic polynomial, figure out what the eigenvalues are, and from the eigenvalues, you can make a prediction about what's going on at the center of the phase plane. That's right. Right? Mm -hmm. Cool. So it's just a matter of solving a couple of quadratic equations. Number 20, we're not going to go into because it turns out I did a crappy job writing that problem uh, only because I think I had written it for a different uh, equation and then I swapped out the equation, but I forgot to check my initial conditions. I kind of screwed it up. But the key for this one is the code, being able to find the code for Euler's method and then recreating that table. Um, so you can try that one. I, personally, I wouldn't. Um, I can't remember who was it. Was it you, Anthony, or who were, was it who had that? Who had this one? Number twenty. I forget. Me. Oh, Wyatt. That's right. So, yeah. Apologies. Number twenty was a, a bit of a, a hot mess on my my account. But go back and review the Euler's method. This is section one point four. And that's where we first learned how to use um, Maple to do numerical solutions. So just go back, review 1.4 so that you're ready to do that. Okay, I'm trying to shoehorn everything in, but we're, we're out of time. And I appreciate you guys sticking around for a couple minutes afterwards, but um, we don't have time to do um, team task work, but you have each other to work with. My game plan is tomorrow at noon, I will send out the exam. I've got a couple of tweaks that I'm going to make to it, um, probably tonight, um, so that I've got it ready to go to send out to you. It's going to go out to you at noon. If you don't hear from me or you don't get it, let me know. Maybe I, maybe it got screwed up and it's in the mail somewhere. I don't know. Uh, but otherwise, it'll be coming out to you at noon tomorrow. You have through noon on Monday to finish the final exam, the solo part of the final exam. And then on Monday, we'll be doing, in class, we'll be doing um, solutions for the team tasks. The last thing I just want to show you real quick, just to make sure that you're comfortable with this idea, is on Monday, 
you will be asked to fill out one of these little team assessments for um, each of the teams that presents their solution other than your team. And so I'll ask you, who are you? Which team are you evaluating? And then I have these three questions or four questions technically. Um, did the team fully address the task? Did they answer all the questions, do all the things they were supposed to do? Did the team make strong use of Maple in their presentation? Right, Because pretty much everything could use Maple um, a little bit and using it like, I, like I, I did for the example that I gave would be helpful. Uh, did the team answer questions that came up? So if, if no questions come up, then no questions. I'll probably ask some. Uh, and then last but not least, one piece of concrete advice I would give to the team for, um, for future presentations, right? So this is just making sure that you're paying attention and focused. I'll have you fill this out after each one of the team presents and that'll be uh, part of the evaluation. So that's it. I just wanted to show you that so you didn't freak out on Monday when I say, oh, click on this link and go here. So I will hit stop on the record. And if anybody has any questions, you can stick around afterwards. If you have a question about exam review or the exam or the tasks or anything like that, stick around. <laughs>